السلام عليكم ورحمة الله إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما صليت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم إنك حميد مجيد اللهم بارك على محمد وعلى آل محمد كما باركت على إبراهيم وعلى آل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد الله سبحانه وتعالى revealed the Quran every single verse in it it's such a virtuous thing it's the miraculous speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every single surah something that is so important in our life to learn every verse that's why without exaggerating we are wasting our life if we don't go through the Quran one verse after another like the companions radiallahu anhum did they studied the Quran 10 verses after 10 verses they would recite them they would learn the rulings and how to act according to the verses of the Qur'an and they would act according to them and then they would go to the next 10 verses and so on. And this is how the Qur'an raised them. And this is why they were the best generation ever brought to mankind because they followed the book of Allah and the way of the Prophet ﷺ. It's a great blessing for us to be able to recite and ponder over the verses of the Qur'an and again, every verse is such a virtuous thing, something that we need to study and to learn. But the most virtuous verse in the whole entire Qur'an is Ayatul Kursi. And this is what we reached from the beginning of uh, Surah Al-Fatiha till verse number 255 in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is Ayatul Kursi, a verse that most of us, we know it by heart. We teach it to our children. They memorize it. We say it many times throughout the day and the night because it's the, the most virtuous verse in the Qur'an. The most virtuous one meaning the most rewardable when it comes to reciting it, that we are in need of it. We are in need of all the Qur'an, every verse in it. But the subject of Ayatul Kursi, and that's why it's the most virtuous and the most important verse in the Qur'an, the subject of it is about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most high. The one that the believers love, the perfect love, with his names and attributes. And there is nothing or there is no better subject than when we talk about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes. And that's why this verse is so virtuous because of that, because it talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes. So let's uh, recite Ayatul Kursi and get to know the meanings of it and ponder over it and then see how to act according to the meanings of Ayatul Kursi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. La ta'akhuduhu sinatun wa la nawm. Lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Man dha al-lazhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhnih. Ya'lamu ma bayna aydihim wa ma khalfahum. Wa la yuhiituna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bima sha'a. وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم which roughly translates Allah there is no deity except him the ever living the sustainer of all existence neither drowsiness overtakes him nor sleep to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission he knows what is presently before them and what will be after them and they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills. His kursi extends over the heavens and the earth and their preservation tires him not and he is the most high, the most great. This verse is ten sentences. Each sentence 
needs the time for us to ponder over it and to get to know the meaning of it. And for each sentence of these 10 sentences to affect our heart. And this is what we need to do with the whole entire Quran. First, why this is the most, or what is the evidence that this is the most important and the most virtuous verse in the Quran? This is some, something said by the Prophet ﷺ, by the other type of wahi, by the other type of revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. That's why we cannot live without both of them, the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet, of the Prophet ﷺ. Ubay ibn Ka'b, one of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and this is mentioned in Sahih al-Imam al-Bukhari and others, when the Prophet ﷺ asked him, uh, about uh, what is the most important and the most virtuous verse in the Quran. Ayu ayatin fi kitab Allahi a'zam. He asked him what is the most virtuous ayah verse in the Quran. So Ubay ibn Ka'b he said Allah wa Rasuluhu a'lam. Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam knows best. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeated the question and Ubay ibn Ka'b repeated the answer. And the question by itself and repeating it Although Ubay ibn Ka'b would say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger know best, this is a way to get the attention of Ubay ibn Ka'b and to get out that the answer is not just a simple thing for us to uh, hear it and not to act according to it. It's something that is very serious. And then at the end the Prophet sallallahu told him when, when he asked him three times, then Ubay ibn Ka'b he said Ayatul Kursi. Ubay ibn Ka'b answered and he said Ayatul Kursi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi congratulated him and his knowledge, and he said, That means uh, that you are blessed, and congratulations for the knowledge that you have, O Abu Mundir, the kunya, the nickname of Ubay ibn Ka'b. So this is such a virtuous verse, and there are many hadith when it comes to Ayat al-Kursi, one of which it's a famous hadith, the hadith of Abi Huraira radiallahu anhu. I won't mention the hadith in details, because we want to explain the verse, and you can refer back to Tafsir ibn Kathir or others, you would find the hadith there. Where Abu Huray radiallahu anhu used to, he was uh, keeping or, 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 or uh, protecting the zakah of Ramadan. And then uh, someone would come at night and would take something from it and he caught him. And he wanted to uh, take him to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So he kept complaining to him that I have children, I'm poor and so on. He, and he would have mercy on him and he would leave him. This is something that happened three times. And every time the Prophet sallallahu would ask Abu Huray radiallahu anhu, what did your... Uh, uh, captive did with you last night of oh, Abu Huraira and Abu Huraira would tell him that I left him because he complained and so on so the Prophet ﷺ would tell him that he will come back to you again and after the third time uh, this was a shaitan coming to Abu Huraira and the only way that he would leave him is that the shaitan told him that if you say Ayatul Kursi before you go to sleep you will be protected from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is no shaitan will approach you and the Prophet ﷺ approved of what the shaitan said, and he said, Sadaqat, wa huwa kathub, that he was honest in this, although he is a liar. And then the Prophet ﷺ stated the fact that whoever recites Ayatul Kursi before he go to sleep, then he has a protection from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As we know that the shaitan is our everlasting enemy, and he tries with all different means to cause harm to the believers and to keep the disbelievers as disbelievers. And the most or the weakest point that a person is in is when he is asleep. So the shaitan can cause harm, physical harm, by different means. So the way to protect ourselves from the harm of the shaitan is by depending with our hearts on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing happens except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a way of which is to recite ayatul kursi before going to sleep. So this is something that we would do every day before going to sleep and teaching that to our children and reciting that to them and so on. We say also Ayatul Kursi at the end and after we finish every Salah. And there's a hadith, although there's differences of opinion of its authenticity, the hadith that if a person recites Ayatul Kursi after each Salah, the only thing that would prevent the person from entering Jannah is to die. That means if a person dies and this is his attitude, this is his way, that he would always recite Ayatul Kursi after each Salah. Whenever death comes, this person is among the people of Jannah. And of course, the recitation that we say with our tongues, of course, this is how recitation is, when we move our tongues with the recitation, the Sahaba, عنهم, they didn't use to recite like this without having 
the same meaning passed onto their hearts and having the certainty and the belief and the intentions to apply what we recite. And this is what we need to have the meaning so that we are truthful whenever we recite something. Many virtues to Ayatul Kursi, something that we should constantly say uh, if a person recites that in the homes, the shayateen are prevented from entering. And we know that if the shayateen, they enter the homes, they cause all kinds of harm things. So we need to protect ourselves, protect our children, protect our families by constantly reciting Ayatul Kursi. And the more we get to know the meaning of it, the more we would benefit from it. So let's uh, look into the ayah, into the verse with its ten sentences. The first sentence, Allahu la ilaha illahu. Allahu la ilaha illahu means Allah, the Almighty, the Most Wise, the Most Merciful subhanahu wa ta'ala. There is no one worthy of worship except Him. See, the verse started with Allah, the most beautiful name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The name that because of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the heavens and the earth to worship Him alone subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why when you, see, when you find the verse started with Allah, this brings so much uh, the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the heart and show the importance of the verse and this is linguistically is something that is very powerful the verse did not st start with la ilaha illallah it starts with Allah la ilaha illahu so that this is the first word that enters the heart from the first or the most virtuous verse in the Quran and the word Allah the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that encompasses all the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the root meaning of it comes from the one to be worshipped with perfect love and perfect submission. This is the meaning of Allah. This is what we need to uh, uh, call people to understand. When non-Muslims, they ask about the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is not correct to say that it means God. right? Because God can be plural, can be feminine, can be masculine, but can be many things. But when we say Allah and we explain to them, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one that sustains the lives, the one to be worshipped. So that the only one worthy of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, when you say Allah, all the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes under the name Allah. Allahu la ilaha illahu, there is no ilah, there is no one to be worshipped, there is no one worthy of worship, and this is the meaning of ilah, right? It does not mean there is no creator. Although there's no creator except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no sustainer but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but ilah means the one to be worshipped. Because when the messengers were sent to their people, they were not sent to the people to call them to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, or that He's the creator, the sustainer. And we would see that clearly in the Quran, people believed in that by necessity, by default. But the messengers, they called the people to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, not to associate partners with Allah, and this is the meaning of the first pillar of Islam. The most beautiful word, the most important thing in our life, and that is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. Allahu la ilaha illahu, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there is no one worthy of worship except Him. See how the word is, is made with negation and affirmation as we talked about it before. La ilaha, there is no one worthy of worship. You have to disbelieve. In all that is being worshipped besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and then you state the fact and you affirm the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship, illahu. And this is even will be explained in more details in the next verse after Ayatul Kursi. Allahu la ilaha illahu. This is the first statement. This is the first pillar of Islam. And how to act according to this? This is our whole entire life. Our whole entire life is according to la ilaha illallah. Muhammadur Rasulullah. And how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's through the way of the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam, to know the conditions of la ilaha illallah, to act according to la ilaha illallah, to humble ourselves, to submit ourselves to the Most High Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. al hayy al qayyum al hayy al qayyum Two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and two attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ever-living, the sustainer of all that exists. al hayy the ever-living. Al-Hayy is the ever-living, the one that uh, uh, is ever-living, everlasting living. There is no beginning and there is no end. And this is uh, a unique attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some of the ulama, like Shaykh al-Sain Taymiyyah rahimahullah, used to consider that this is uh, ismullah al-a'zam, that this is the most 
a virtuous name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we know from the hadith that whoever asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with uh, his most important name, the dua will be accepted. The hadith did mention what is the name. Some said is al hayy and some said is al hayy al qayyum Right, and this is also mentioned in some of the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in mentioning this verse and in the second verse of Surah Ali Imran, also it mentions al hayy al qayyum So uh, this is such an important name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when a Muslim would use it in his dua. And again, it's mentioned in the most virtuous verse. So al hayy al qayyum the, the life uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an eternal one, everlasting one, and it's a perfect one, not like the life of the human beings. Because the human beings, they get their life from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one that gives them the life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ever-living subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when people would put their trust, they should not put their trust on someone that is about to die, or someone that is born and die and so on. But they should put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَوَكَّلْ عَلَى الْحَيِّ الَّذِي لَا يَمُوتِ Put your trust on the one that is ever-living that never dies. And that's the opposite of this name. We continue, inshallah ta'ala, right after the break, so stay with us, inshallah. <laughs> Ask Huda. If you're still in Mecca, or close by to Mecca, then you have to know that you are still in the state of Ihram. As long as it is not for sale, mm -hmm then he does not have to pay the kafir. Forbade praying witr, similar to Maghrib prayer. Mm -hmm. So whoever prays witr, three rak'ahs, and sitting after the second rak'ah as if he's praying Maghrib prayer, this is forbidden, this is haram. To euthanasia is permissible with animals, but not with human beings. If an animal is suffering, killing an animal for a legitimate reason is permissible. Both uh, are acceptable, but the majority say that after the rakur is the place of uh, qunut. But both was reported. Have a question or concern on your mind? Hoda TV decided, based on popular demand, he will be bringing you an additional episode of Ask Hoda with Sheikh Azim bin Luqman al-Hakim live from Jeddah, Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Alhamdulillah, salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah with Ayatul Kursi, the most virtuous verse in the Quran and we're still in the second sentence of the verse al Hayyul Qayyum, two of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if we spend uh, what is uh, uh, the time to, to, to explain these words and, these, and this verse in full details this will take us so many episodes but just to be as precise as we can, al hayyul Al-Qayyum, the ever-living, Al-Qayyum, the one, as we heard, the sustainer of all that exists, that everything is in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything cannot stand alone, cannot be existing on its own. It's in need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He did not create His creation and left them, but they are in constant need of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us this life, how? Are we sustaining our life? We do not sustain our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that sustains our life. The breath that we take, it's all by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the one subhanahu wa ta'ala that maintains this universe and our life and so on and so forth. So uh, this is something that the believers, they witness. Of course, this has an effect in our life. We would find a result or an outcome when it comes to believing in these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would witness the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We would put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why would a person then commit sins and disobeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to please human beings, those who are deficient and weak and so on and so forth? Instead, we should depend with our hearts on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone because He is al Hayyul al Qayyum, the ever-living, the one that sustains the life of all that exists, the tyrants and the poor and the rich and everyone all of their life, lives are sustained by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The third statement, لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Which means, neither drowsiness overtakes him nor sleep. لا تأخذه, it doesn't take him. Sina, drowsiness, slumber. 
uh, the, the level that comes before deep sleep, when a person is in between being awake and being asleep, which is definitely a point of deficiency, right? A person, a human being, when he's in that state, he might not be functioning well, right? When he's about to sleep, when he's drowsy, when he's slumber, you know, uh, falling asleep. And this is something that is a deficient attribute. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being the most perfect subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes, he does not sleep and he does not even have this drowsiness that the human beings have because nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the perfection of having both mentioned together. There's no sleep overtakes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is the maintainer and the sustainer of all that exists. And if there is no sustenance to the to the people and to the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything is perished and destroyed. It all holds itself. It's all in that place and in that perfection and life is sustained and all of that is by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is something that is in the belief of the believers that خُدْهُ سِنَةٌ وَلَا No drowsiness overtakes him, nor sleep because he's the most perfect subhanahu wa ta'ala and there's no deficiency when it comes to the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, this also has an interesting point. We see as human beings Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in such a way that we sleep and we'd feel drowsy and we'd feel when we are sleepy, we are sleepy and so on. This is meant to be this way so that the human beings, they would witness clearly that they are nothing but slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They are not the creators. They are not the Lord of uh, the heavens and the earth. There, was, there is no need for them to be arrogant over one another, for them to turn away from the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because if a person does not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a form of arrogance. Why would a person do not, do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Uh, that's why the believers, when they read this, when they recite this, and when they witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us in such a way that we have to sleep. We cannot uh, uh, prevent ourselves from sleeping. You see someone that he might be very powerful, uh, very strong, but then what happens when it's time for him to sleep, he is overtaken by sleep. And that's why the word... لا تأخذه, right? He is not overtaken by sleep. This is such a, an important statement here because if you try to keep yourself awake and you're a very strong person, very smart and so on, what happens? A person will crash. And this is the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the human beings are so deficient. And when they crash and when they are asleep and they were overtaken by sleep, you look at that person that used to, when he's awake, he would say, I did and I did and I'm such a person, I'm such and such. He is laying down helpless, no power whatsoever. All to show the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That we are nothing but uh, slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we need to choose then to be obedient slaves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Great effect in the life of the believers. The next statement, له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض, Which means to him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on the earth. See the more one statement after another, the more you find yourself as humble as you can. The more that you would see how the ubudiyah and the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that we are nothing but slaves and servants of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, comparing our attributes with the attributes of the most high, the most perfect subhanahu wa ta'ala. Lahu, and the, the order of the sentences in the Arabic language gives you certain feelings. To him belongs what's in the heavens and what's in the earth. This can be said in a different way. You can say what's in the heavens and what's in the earth belongs to him. But when you start the sentence by saying lahu, to him belongs what's in the heavens and the earth, gives that exclusiveness, that it's only belonging to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the owner of all things. All that exists in the heavens and in the earth is all owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, belongs to him. That means what? That means he is the most perfect with his names and attributes. For a person to say this and to be honest with oneself, that means our actions should be accordingly. What we have on the face of earth, when it comes to ownership, Islam of course protects and admire and respect the ownership of the human being. But this is a deficient ownership. It's ownership versus one another. This is mine versus yours. But in reality, when we think about it, everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even our own selves. And that's why we leave everything behind when we, when we die. And that's why we look into wealth, we look into the things that we have, 
as we are being entrusted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How are we going to spend it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How are we going to do things according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? So being rich or being poor or whatever, the person has to witness that everything belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that set the rules and he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that nobody is to question him. لا يسأل عما يفعل وهم يسألون because he's the owner of all things and people should obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض then the next statement من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه which means who is it that can intercede with him except by his permission. يشفع or الشفاعة intercession is when a person and شفاعة comes from something that is two. That's why we say الشفع and الوتر. الشفع is something that is even. So a shafa'a means someone that is alone and he needs the help basically of someone that he would uh, be with him so that he would intercede for him. So that he would ask for some goodness and so on. People they do that in their livelihood. They would uh, seek intercession of one way or the other to get their affairs done and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high he stated the fact that there are some other human beings will intercede with one another in the day of judgment. And this intercession is nothing but the, by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this what is stated in the verse. Many people they fell into the trap of shirk and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because the issue of the shafa'a or the intercession. When they heard the hadith of the verses of the Quran that certain people would have shafa'a, intercession, like the Prophet ﷺ would intercede for his ummah in the Day of Judgment. And there are more than one type of shafa'a for the Prophet ﷺ to all mankind and to the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ and so on. Or the intercession of the pious and the righteous ones to one another. And the intercession of the martyrs and so on and so forth. So people might think that their hearts can be then attached to these individuals, to these human beings. And they would ask them, they would ask them to intercede for them. And they think that this is something belongs to them. So they would worship them besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They would call unto them and make dua, not to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but to the deceased, to those who are dead. Thinking that when they call them, then they would intercede for them in the day of judgment. And this is all the work of shaitan. And this is an evidence that man the ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'ithni. That nobody would intercede to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala except by the permission of Allah. Even the Prophet as it's mentioned in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim and others, where the Prophet وسلم, in the Day of Judgment, when he would be given the intercession, he will prostrate and make sujood by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for as long as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills and he would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with ways that he never knew before that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will guide them, will guide him to say with the praise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and ways to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the human beings did know before. And then after that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would say to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Muhammad, irfa' ra'sak, sal tu'ata, ishfa' tu shaffa' which means, O Muhammad, raise your head, ask and you will be given, intercede and you will be uh, fulfilled what you want, meaning you would intercede. So that after the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there are three principles very quickly for us to uh, purify our hearts and to take the roots of shirk and associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and depending with our hearts on to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to extract that from our hearts when it comes to matters of shafa'a. First, it is only by the permission of Allah, so only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it. The second thing is, it's given to those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor them in the day of judgment, like the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like the prophets, like the righteous ones and so on, to honor them in front of all mankind. The third principle in this is that the shafa'a, the intercession, would only be for those who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with, meaning the subject of the shafa'a, the subject of the intercession, those who committed major sins and died in the state of a sin, and they deserve to enter the hellfire, and the Prophet sallallahu would intercede for them, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they will be protected and they would enter the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this shafa'a the intercession they won't get the benefit of it unless Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with them 
so it's after the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, then the shafa'ah would work for them. So that means what? That means never depend with your heart on, to anyone but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Matters of shafa'ah, we only ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for it because it's clearly stated that, for, that way. And this is why the companions of Allah anhum, they never asked it from anyone. They only asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because dua is an act of worship and it's not permissible to be done to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Man dhaladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi'ithni. Also it states the fact that shafa'a is part of our religion, part of our belief. The Prophet ﷺ makes shafa'a intercede for the sinners of this ummah. Intercede for the human beings for the reckoning to start. And the Prophet ﷺ also would be the first one to enter Jannah. This is a form of intercession. And he would intercede also for his uncle, Abu Talib, in which he would be relieved from uh, uh, the severe punishment in the Hafai, but he would not go out of the Hafai because he died in the state of disbelief. Right? He would be the least among the people of the Hafai. So there are many different types of Shafa'a intercession of the Prophet. ﷺ, so we believe in it the way it's mentioned in the Quran and in the Sunnah of the Prophet. ﷺ. The next statement which means he knows what's uh, presently before them and what will be after them. يَعْلَمُ مَا بَيْنَ أَيْدِيهِمْ وَمَا خَلْفَهُمْ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala يَعْلَمْ That He knows. And this is one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ilm. The knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything. What's in the past, what's in the future, what's present, the impossible if it happened, how it would happen if it happened, even if it's impossible and it would never happen. Right? And this is something that is in the belief of the believers. And evidence of that the things that would never happen. If it happened, how would it happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows this. As it's mentioned in the Quran, وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ وُقِفُوا عَلَى النَّرِ When uh, you would see them standing by the hellfire, and they would ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bring us back to this life so that we would repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَوْ رُدُّوا لَعَادُوا لِمَا نُهُوا عَنْ وَإِنَّهُمْ لَكَاذِبُونَ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if they would return if they would, would be returned to the world, to this dunya again, they would still go back to the same things that they used to do when they were alive on the face of earth. This is the type of knowledge in which nobody would ever, for example, go back to this world. Once a person dies, that's it. He's going forward. Nobody is going back to this world. But even when they asked for it, if they would have, have went back to this world, they would still have done what they used to do in matters of disbelief. So the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's between their hands, meaning what is present, what is uh, in front of them, uh, what's uh, before them, and what's behind them, physically and also when it comes to time-wise. The past, the present, the future, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one that knows best. That's why we do not know. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu ya'lam wa antum la ta'lamun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows and you do not know. We do not know anything except but what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to know. So that's why we need to depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He knows and we do not know. That's why the dua of al-istikhara, when a person is not sure what to make a decision or not, the Prophet ﷺ ordered us to pray to raka'ah and then after the salam, we make the dua of al-istikhara. In the dua of al-istikhara, in it, the believers would say, Allahumma in kunta ta'lam. Oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you know that this is, uh, and you mention what you want, is good for me in, in, in my religion, in my present life, and uh, in my, the, the future one, the hereafter, and my future life, then make it easy for me, and so on. Allahumma in kunta ta'lam, anna hadha al-amr khayru li fi dini, wa ma'ashi wa akhirati amri. That, oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you know that this matter, is good for my religion, and the religion comes first, and the outcome of my affairs, and the hereafter, and so on, then make it easy for me, and so on, and so forth. So, uh, depending with our hearts, when it comes to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's the one that knows everything, and His knowledge encompasses everything, that increase again more, the attribute of being humble, and slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is another attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then, we would see the next statement, but right after the break. So stay with us, inshallah ta'ala, with the most virtuous verse of the Quran, Ayatul Kursi, that we need to memorize it. 
We need to say it many times throughout the day and the night in specific times, specific places and so on. And to get to know the meaning of it so that we would get more and more rewards the more we recite it. And the more we know the meaning of it, the more that the benefit of the verse when we recite it will be inshallah ta'ala for us in this life and in the hereafter. So stay with us inshallah. <laughs> Subhanahu wa ta'ala choose whom he wills subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, for his messengership, for the revelation to be revealed. This is not for the human beings to make that decision. If a person would turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, truthfully, asking for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to forgive. We have as Muslims a duty and that is to recite the book of Allah, to ponder over the verses, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act according to the Qur'an. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything, but it who would this mercy will be for. And the Prophet sallallahu was sent to all mankind. So the ummah or the people of the Prophet sallallahu are all mankind since the time of the Prophet sallallahu till the day of judgment. Why waste our life without getting to know every verse in the Qur'an, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Uh, with the verse Ayatul Kursi, the most virtuous verse in the Quran, we reach the statement which means that uh, they encompass not a thing of his knowledge except for what he wills. is encompassing something. That you would encompass something, that you would get to see it from all ways and different directions, that you comprehend it very well, that you uh, not just looking at one side and not the other, that you would comprehend the matter, that you would uh, know it very well. So no one can encompass anything of the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illa bima sha except what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wills by revealing to the messengers of Allah. When the messenger are revealed to them from the wahi, from the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, from the knowledge that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would reveal to them, this is what we get to know about the unseen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, when the people ask the Prophet about a ruh, about the soul, يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الرُّوحِ قُلِ الرُّوحُ مِنْ أَمْرِ رَبِّي وَمَا أُتِيتُمْ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا They ask you, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about a ruh, the soul. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says it's from the affairs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, matters of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَا أُتِيتُ مِنَ الْعِلْمِ إِلَّا قَلِيلًا You are only given a very small portion of the knowledge. Not that much, very small portion. And the unseen belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and only He allows for the human beings to get to know certain things. Even when people discover things on the face of earth, matters in the space and so on, it's all by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it's all very small, very minute amount of knowledge compared to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when a person dies and departing from this life, then the unseen becomes clear for the person. And this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, فَبَصَرُكَ الْيَوْمَ حديد, That the, your, your eyesight becomes very sharp and very clear, meaning that you would get to see the unseen. But while we are living on the face of earth, our uh, sight is limited. Our knowledge is according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala permits for us. And that again uh, helps the believers to be more submissive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and more obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because again, we are nothing but slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the essence of the ubudiyya, not arrogance and not to think that we can do it on our own, that we can sustain our life, that we... Well, some people think that they do not need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How can a person believe that way when we recite certain verses like that in the Quran? Then the next statement, His kursi 
extends over the heavens and the earth. Al-Kursi, literally the word Kursi means uh, a stool, right? And uh, this is something that we should, we should take it the way it is, right? This is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as Ibn Abbas, radiallahu anhuma, he said in the explanation of this, that this is Mawdu al-Qadam. This is the place of the foot of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any attribute that we hear, we say nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Laysa kamithli shay, wa huwa sami'u al-basir. Nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he's the all-hearer, the all-seer. The companion, radiallahu when he says this, he says this based on knowledge that he got to know from the Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam. So we believe in everything that is being mentioned, and we do not resemble it to the attributes of the human beings. We should not allow this to come into our mind, and we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best how these attributes are, but to understand the meaning of it, because the Qur'an is revealed in the Arabic language. We do not say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best about the meaning of it. We know the meaning of it, but we do not resemble it to the attributes of the human being. We do not deny it. We do not distort the meanings of it. We believe in it in the way that it is, it's been revealed to the Prophet sallallahu And we say nothing is the like of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some said or related, referred that to Ibn Abbas anhu, that he said it means al-ilm or knowledge. But this is a weak narration. And some said it's the arsh, the throne of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, like Al-Hasan al basri but this is also not the correct opinion because Al-Kursi is something and Al-Arsh is something else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is tawa ala Al-Arsh, rose over his throne subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that fits his majesty and his power subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the Kursi is different. This is the place of the foot as Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma he said. So we keep it Kursi and that's why you would see in the translation his Kursi. Wasi'a Kursiyuhu samawati wal ard that the Kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends over the heavens and the earth. How great is this creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is compared to, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in the hadith, that one heaven after the other. There are seven skies, right? Seven heavens. And each heaven compared to the one after is like a ring in a desert. Something that a person cannot comprehend with one's mind. That this whole entire world that we live in, that we do not know the, the end of it, this is the first heaven, the first sky compared to the next one is like a ring in a desert. And the second to the third is like a ring to the desert and so on. And then the seven heavens or the seven skies compared to the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like a ring in the desert. And uh, that also compared to the arsh is like a ring to the desert. So you see the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how deficient and weak and small and all kinds of things that we need to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to humble ourselves to the creator of the heavens and the earth. So wasi'a kursiyuhu samawati wal ard shows the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that the kursi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extends over the heavens and the earth. And the ninth statement in the verse وَلَا يَؤُودُهُ حِفْظُهُمَا which means that and their preservation tires him not. The preservation of the heavens and the earth does not tire, cause tiredness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's the most perfect with his names and attributes. For a person to keep holding as human beings with all of our divisions and to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the best example. We as human beings, we cannot even carry something that is a little bit heavy for a certain period of time. Imagine uh, uh, what is a building, for example, or a street or a city or the whole entire earth or the universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created is all by the control of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nothing cause tiredness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the most high, the most powerful. That means depend with your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that your victory, your help, uh, your happiness in this life and in the hereafter is by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't seek it from anyone else. Where as the Prophet sallallahu said, فَإِنَّهُ لَا يُنَالُ مَا عِنْدَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا بِطَاعَتِهِ that you do not seek anything except by the obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you want something from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He's the owner of all things, and you cannot get anything from anyone except by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you want something, the way to do that is by being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nothing uh, causing, uh, or causes tiredness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and hifduhuma, to keep them, to preserve them, to maintain them with this power, 
and this magnificent universe, right, that we only know a very small portion of it, it's all preserved by the Most High, the Most Powerful, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last statement in the verse, وَهُوَ الْعَلَيُّ الْعَظِيمُ And He subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Most High, the Most Great. وَهُوَ الْعَلَيُّ الْعَلَيُّ is the Most High. And as the ulama, they explain علو الذات and علو القدر, that He is subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the Most High, that He is over His creation subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why when, as it's mentioned in the hadith in Sahih Muslim, when the Prophet ﷺ asked the young girl and he asked her, uh, where is Allah? And this is a valid question. Ain Allah? Where is Allah? This is a valid question. It's not uh, a haram question. It's a valid question. And she said, Fis sama, In the heavens, meaning over the creation, over the heavens, over His creation, subhanahu wa ta'ala, over His throne. So He is the most high, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the answer should not be that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is everywhere. This is a form of deviation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is over His creation. He is with his creation, with his knowledge and his power and so on. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al arsh over his creation, over his throne, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that he is the most high when it comes to power and wisdom and mercy and so on and so forth. With all the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is the most high. And for the most high, people need to be the most humble. They need to humble themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he is the most high. That's why the most uh, virtuous and the most or the closest position that we be in in matters of salah is the sujood. When you humble yourself the most to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the time where the dua is accepted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because He is Al-Ali. He is the most high subhanahu wa ta'ala. A person worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with these names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you would find that his whole entire life or her whole entire life will totally change. When we worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we hear the time for the salah, when we hear the adhan for example, the one that is calling us to make the salah is ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to come to worship the most high subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone believing in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with his names and attributes, would he turn away from the orders of Allah, thinking that he can be better off without making salah for example? If a person would understand the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He is the Most High, would he still earn haram and what is not permissible, thinking that he can sustain his life on his own terms, forgetting about the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? By knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the Most High and the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most perfect, is to recite the book of Allah and to act accordingly. That's why the effect of these attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's the most great. He's the greatest subhanahu wa ta'ala over all things. And we say that word in our salah, subhanahu rabbi al azim and so on and so forth. It's meanings that needs to be settled in our hearts, to believe in it, and to make sure that when we recite Ayatul Kursi many times throughout the day, as we said before, before you go to sleep, after each salah, in the morning and in the evening, make sure that you say it with this type of understanding with this type of pondering over the meaning, with this certainty, so that you would benefit from the verse in this life, protection in this life, and to enter the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and for our affairs to be according to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants for us, to enjoy the deen of Islam. This religion of Islam, we need to enjoy it. We need to enjoy the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why we are living before it's too late. And this is the way to enjoy the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by pondering over the Quran, pondering over the most virtuous verse in the Qur'an Ayatul Kursi, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us benefit from it and to uh, make us among those who entered the Jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا فَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ 
وَلَوْ كَانَ مِنْ عِنْدِ غَيْرِ اللَّهِ لَوَجَدُوا فِيهِ اخْتِلَافًا كَثِيرًا 